and I are going to be teaching primarily with a focus on hearing God, but especially with a focus on hearing God in real life. We want to take it out of the context of religion and put it in the context of life and then bring religion to support that. I like to say that the church is for discipleship. Discipleship is for the world. The desperate need of humanity, which God looks upon and sends his Son and his Spirit and his people and his word to minister to. The kingdom of God is real life. And life in the kingdom of God is the very life that we live. And so we want to focus on that. And then we're going to be talking about hearing God in that context. This evening I want to lay a, hopefully a solid theological foundation for talk about hearing God. Then we have an exercise to leave with you at the end. But now I want to focus us very narrowly on what this is all about. And I'd ask you to look at the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, and the 17th verse. Romans 5, 17. And I'd like to just meditatively read this verse with you and emphasize the different parts that stand out to the person who wants to know what it's like to live fully with Jesus in the kingdom of God today. And here's what Paul says. If by the transgression of the one, that was Adam, death reigned through the one, and that's the condition of humanity as you see it about you today. It's the reign of death. Much more, much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and are the gift of righteousness will reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What we're talking about here in these days is actually reigning in life by Christ Jesus. And I'd like you to just think a moment about what that word reign means. Reign means to govern for good. Under God, that is the call of every human being in their time and place to be the salt and light of the world where they stand by governing for good through Jesus Christ. Reign. Um, that word is the word that we often use when we're trying to explain kingdom, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's an old-fashioned word. Americans tend not to like it very much. Uh, because they've had a history of problems with kingdoms, as you know. And uh, so we need to understand that it's not tied just to that one idea of government, but it's the idea of governing for good, reigning. The kingdom of God is simply the range of God's effective will. It's where what God wants done is done. And we know through sad experience that ca that cannot be done by human beings acting on their own. Human beings are meant to reign under God. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're made to do. We'll be expanding on that a little bit. But that's what every human being really wants, is to be able to reign for good. I lecture often on ethics in secular and other contexts, and very often I will ask the group, is there anyone here who would like to be 
a bad person. I've never had a single person say, yes, I want to be a bad person. Now, the human condition is one where we don't want to do what is bad, but we find it necessary. The little girl in Sunday schools asked, what is a lie? And she said, it is an abomination to God and a very present help in time of trouble. <laughs> and if we're, going to, if we're going to run our kingdom, we're going to need a little help. And that is what is brought out in the verse. Because you have the situation where human beings have tried to run their kingdom, and the outcome is death. And we see it worldwide. And we know that Jesus came to abolish death. And he abolished his death by bringing what life is really about to light. The wonderful verse in 2 Timothy 1.10, Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. One of the great reliefs of the person who has found their place under God is they never have to do anything wrong. Never. They never have to do anything wrong. And you know how people tend to say, well, I must. I don't know if you've ever heard that saying, someone saying, well, business is business. And you know what they're getting ready to do when they say that. They're getting ready to do what they know to be wrong. And so we have to reply back, business is never just business. Business is always God's business. So you have to be living in the kingdom of God to say that. You have to be prepared to let God step in and take care of what human necessity says you must do wrong. And it's a great burden that is lifted off of people when they learn the abundance of grace. Now, grace is God acting in your life to accomplish what you can't accomplish on your own. That's what grace is. Abundance of grace. Uh, lots of it. Not just a little bit to sort of get you off the guilt hook. Grace is meant for us to live by. We would have had to have grace if we had never sinned. Because grace is what supplies the need from God to those who are ruling and reigning under him. Grace, God acting in our lives to accomplish what we can't accomplish on our own. Is that forgiveness? You bet your life it is forgiveness. But you know, after you've forgiven, you still have to live, don't you? You might need a little grace with that. Grace to accomplish the good that needs to be accomplished in the place where you are. The good in relation to people who aren't good. The good in relation to things that are impossible for you to do. That's what grace is. Those who receive abundance of grace. Grace is the key to God's kingdom and the key to the human kingdom. And of the gift of righteousness. Now, righteousness is a gift of grace. But notice he's not just talking about righteousness in the sense of being justified and forgiven. He's talking about righteousness as a life, as an activity, as something we live in, wherever we are and whatever we're doing. Righteousness, just the simple ability to do the right thing. And you just think of what a tremendous difference that makes wherever we might be. The gift of righteousness. Righteousness is forgiveness, yes, but righteousness as a life that accords with the kingdom of God. And those who have that will reign in life. 
they will be able to live their lives in a power that enables them to accomplish the good that needs to be done wherever they are. And that righteousness then would affect the economic system, the legal system, the educational system, the military system, all of the dimensions of human life. God calls us into those areas and invites us to live there in his kingdom by his grace. And in so doing, we reign. But the last part is by Jesus Christ. Now that's where we are going to dig in for our time together uh, in the sessions. How does that work? By Jesus Christ. Well, in many respects, it works silently. It often works outside of the range of our consciousness and our efforts. But the essential part of it is in a conscious walk with Jesus Christ. A conscious walk in which there is talk. God speaking to us about what we're doing, where we are in our lives, in our world, and guiding us into the things that we need to do and need to know, but cannot do and cannot know on our own. So God speaking is essential to reigning in life by one Christ Jesus. The book Speaking or Hearing God is like all of my books in religion. They are written out of pastoral concerns. And what I found in trying to lead and teach and help people with their life in Christ was that so many people feel like there is no communication between them and God. And often they only experience it in terms of their prayers. And sometimes they will say, well, I feel like my prayers never get above the ceiling. And, of course, I like to point out to them that God is below the ceiling. Right? as well as above it. Uh, and they need help with understanding that part of it. But the other side of it is they really are unable to identify God speaking to them. And now in these times that we have together tonight and tomorrow, we want to try to deal with uh, problems that are created in the minds of people that make them have that thought that God does not speak to them. All kinds of problems. Like, who am I that he would speak to me? How could God speak to me if he's away out yonder and I'm here? Our ideas about God hurt us in prayer and in communication. And our ideas about ourselves perhaps hurt us even more. And so we have to deal with those kinds of issues. But we just want to say God speaking is the assumption of the life that God presents to us in the Bible. Listen to a couple of passages here from the Old Testament. Psalm 32 God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. See, this is a very intimate relationship of living before the face of God and God speaking and directing us. It's interesting how he follows that up in verse 9. Don't be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding. Now, that's an important thing to notice. Um, a horse and a mule 
has to have a bit in their mouth or some other piece of equipment or harness that allows them to be directed, not just spoken to. And what God is bringing out here in this passage is that's not his preferred model, to have to put a bit in your mouth and something to pull you around. The preferred model is the understanding. Listen what he says. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include a bit and a bridle to hold them in check. God's way of addressing us is through our understanding. He speaks to us. And we have in the morning to go over very carefully what that's like. But I want you to understand now that God's preferred way of communicating is to speak to us. Listen to these words from Isaiah 30. Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher, and your ears will hear a word behind you, this is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right or to the left. That's Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 and 21. Now, I read those to you at this point because I want to emphasize that God speaking is a reality. I want to add that it is for every person who has been brought to life by Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. And that is another thing that we need to emphasize is you learn to know the voice of God by experience, by repetition, like you learn to know the voice of another person. These little suggestions we'll be developing more as we go along. But right now, what I want to emphasize to you is that hearing God is not just an episode. It's a life. Many people have trouble with hearing God because they don't understand that it is a part of a life of hearing God. A life that is devoted to God and to learning how to interact with him. God normally will not run over you. That's why there's so much in the Bible about seeking. Seek the Lord. Seek his face. Seek first the kingdom of God. If with all your heart you truly seek me. Now, that didn't say, if you half-heartedly seek me. And one of the things that we have to understand is, If you want to live a life of hearing God, you have to be devoted to that. It isn't a little something on the side. See, many people make the mistake of thinking that they can sort of live their life and if they need a little help, ask God for it. But God does not cooperate with that. Now, he can do anything he wants to. And if he wants to, he can holler at you loud enough that you cannot possibly avoid. But if that happens, you probably won't know what happened. You remember the case where God spoke to Jesus and said, I approve of you. And the people standing there said, it thundered. See, See, you don't automatically understand what God is saying, or that he is saying, just because he said it. Some people make the mistake of thinking that if God ever spoke to them, they would automatically recognize it. But the picture that you get from the scriptures is, no, it comes to a person who is living a certain kind of life. 
And now I want to spend a little time on that because it's absolutely central to what we are saying and what we're going to be saying. Because reigning goes with seeking. And the seeking is everywhere. We want to hear God everywhere. We seek to hear God everywhere. Now, there is a contrast in the scriptures that is really important for us to understand, and that is the contrast between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh and the spirit. Romans 8 is perhaps the greatest expression of this. Because you remember in Romans 8, Paul has been delivered from Romans 7. Right? He says in Romans 7, he's carrying on about the struggle that he's having. Woe is me. I do the things I don't want to do and don't do the things that I do want to do. And he winds up with this cry right at the end of Romans 7, Who shall deliver me? from the body of this death. Now what you see there is a picture of a man who has tried to live what is right in his natural abilities. And the natural abilities are what flesh is. Flesh is not bad. God made flesh. Flesh is the natural abilities of the human being, not just by themselves, but also grouped together. And now, if you, if you make that your total resource, the inevitable result will be, just like the little girl said, you're going to need some help in time of trouble because we're not made to live on our own. Now, so just listen to these words now in Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation. That is, everything that was wrong in Paul in Romans 7, that is removed. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. The law which takes me over as I try to live on my own and from my own resources leads to death. But now the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has entered me. And Paul continues to say, for what the law could not do in that it was weak, through the flesh. Now, what's the flesh? Natural abilities. God did by sending his son into the flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and because of what sin is, defeating it in its home town, if you wish. Jesus came right into that. And because he lived in union with his father, Sin did not overcome him. The spirit is one thing, the flesh is another. Now, I have to lean on you a little bit here just to say, spirit is unbodily, personal power. Can you, can you stand that? <laughs> a little heavy theology. What is spirit? Spirit is unbodily, personal power. It's a person. Who does the Bible say is spirit? God is spirit. Now what does that mean? It means he is unbodily, personal power. His kingdom is the exercise of his will. God's kingdom is present where what he wants done is done. 
And that's only when he is in charge and providing the resources. Flesh and spirit. I choose whether or not I will trust the flesh or I will trust the spirit. When Jesus is concluding his stay here with his people and preparing them for work, he says, as you go through life, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all spiritual. They are unbodily personal power. And I hope you will believe that when he said baptize them in the name, he didn't mean just get them wet while you say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name in biblical terms always refers to the reality. Make disciples to Jesus. Submerge them in Trinitarian reality. And then teach them to do everything that I've commanded. See, there's order there. The disciple is one who has turned away from the flesh and has brought it into subordination to the Spirit. It's so important to understand that because for Paul, and certainly for Jesus, there was the realization that only by living in terms of the Spirit Could you have life? Could you have righteousness? The Spirit brings life. Here's what Paul continues on there in Romans 8 to say. He says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now, prepositions are among the most unruly members of the grammarian family. And uh, the the word there is kata. Uh, The old version translates it after. You live after the flesh. You live after the spirit. Oh, thank you. Um, In terms of. You live in terms of the flesh. You live in terms of the spirit. And what Paul is saying here is that they who are living in terms of the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. The person who lives in terms of the natural abilities they have and those around them only thinks of those. They don't think of anything else. The person who lives in terms of the Spirit thinks in terms of the Spirit. It's where they put their mind. Now, when they put their mind there, then the Spirit interacts with them. Thinking in terms of the Spirit means my expectations are from God's action in my life. My hopes are there. And my mind is lifted to what God is doing to what the kingdom is doing, to where Jesus is. You remember Colossians chapter 3 starts out by saying, if you've been risen with Christ, think, set your mind on things that are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on the earth. See, that's our part in hearing God is to turn our mind towards him and to listen and to pay attention. Now, of course, it's also to take in what we've already learned from the Word of God, from followers of Christ, from the Holy Spirit, in many ways that he makes his Word present in the world. In nature, for example. God speaks in nature, Psalm 19. Words. Words are how kingdoms work. That's true today, isn't it? 
you elect a president. What do you elect him to do? Basically, you elect him to sign papers. That's words. If he didn't sign papers, he would not have any power except possibly some sort of influence. Kingdoms work by words. You remember the case of that Roman centurion who came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 8. He had a servant or a son who was sick and needed healing. And this man came to Jesus because he had watched Jesus work with words. That's how kingdoms work. And the Roman centurion wanted healing for his servant or his son. And he told Jesus the story. And Jesus said, well, I'll come and heal him. Uh, but the Roman centurion knew that Jesus would be unclean for three days if he did that, and he was a considerate man. He said, oh, you don't need to do that. Just say the word only. See, that's how kingdoms work. You may have wondered why Adam didn't sweat before he fell. Did you ever wonder about that? It's because he worked with the kingdom through words, just like Jesus did. You remember Jesus when he wanted to take out an unfruitful fig tree? He didn't sin for an axe or a saw, did he? How, what did he do? He spoke to it. See? We are meant to live under the kingdom rule of God through the words of God that come to us, and through us, and from us. Words are how kingdoms are. Words are spiritual realities. It is the spiritual nature of the word that ties in with human life and with God's life. Now, let me just try that in, try to tie that back into a general theological context. What is the foundation of everything? It is a society called the Trinity. We have these efforts to articulate the Trinity that we often feel they're onto something, but what is it? Like three persons in one substance. What could that possibly mean? Well, it means that you have three persons. They have different thoughts, different actions, different feelings. But they are so interwoven that they can't exist without one another. Their lives are so bound together. Do you think they talk to one another? What do you think? They just sort of sit there and... Communication is the essence of the Trinity. They love one another. They admire one another. Do you think they ever say that? Do you think the Son ever says to the Father, I just think you're so wonderful. And the Father to the Son, and both to the Spirit. Reality is founded in a personal union that we call the Trinity. Now, out of that personal unity, whose basic nature is love, comes creation. Why did God create? No. He wanted to do something good. That's love. If you love something, what do you want to do for it? Step on it? No. Care for it. Got it. Care. See, that's the nature of love. Why does God do what he does? Because of love. And God is intent on creating as much of what is good as possible. That's why his activity is going to go on forever. 
creation is not over. God pours himself out creatively, constantly. Listen to this that Jesus said in John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled, he said. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. What do you think Jesus is doing now? Does it mean anything that he is preparing a place for you? He is engaged creatively in producing what is ever greater and good. Okay. Now, a part of that means that he creates creators. And who would you think that might be? How about you? He creates creators. And what are they to do? They are to create what is good. And that's the nature of human life. You watch a little child, it comes into this world, as soon as it can do much of anything, it wants to create something, doesn't it? And probably doesn't look like much to you, but you love it anyway because you know the child's heart. And it wants to give you what it has created. And it enjoys giving it so much that it would like to take it back so it could give it again. (laughs) See, that's the nature of human beings. God not only creates, he creates creators. Now, the tragedy of human life is that the created creators turned away from God. And they said, in effect, I would like to have my own kingdom. And that's the human condition. And that is the source of all of the malice and deceit, and hypocrisy, and anger, and lusting that tears the world apart, family after family, neighborhood after neighborhood, nation after nation. It all comes from one thing, the human will to have their way. That's where it all comes from. That's why Jesus said, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake and the gospel, see, that means you've returned your kingdom to his kingdom. And now then, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you are saying, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth. See, that prayer is the invocation of God to take his place in the realm that he has given to us to choose, to allow us to be free, to even choose what is wrong and harmful, because that is the crucible out of which what he has designed for human life to come to be. What does God get out of human history? Good people. People who are surrendered to God. Who have returned through the cross to the throne and are reigning in life through one, Jesus Christ. So when Jesus comes, his message is very simple. Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. Everyone knows that's what he preached, right? And he taught his people to preach it, and John the Baptist preached it before he got here. That's what John the Baptist preached. Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. Now, John actually didn't understand that, but he had been told to say it, and he said it. (laughs) And then Jesus comes, and... And first of all, in our scriptures, in Matthew 4, 17, if you will look, this was his message. Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. What does that mean, repent? It means think about your thinking. 
and see where it has gone wrong. Metanoeti just means to think about your thinking. It doesn't mean to get down and beat your head on the floor, though you may want to do that if you think about your thinking a little while. It means that you come to see how things have gone wrong as human beings have asserted their kingdom against God's kingdom. And to forsake that posture and come back under the lordship of Christ in his kingdom. And oh, what a difference that makes. What kind of a life that is. You see, when we turn back our kingdom to God's kingdom, The effect of that is, for example, what you see in the 23rd Psalm. Think about the 23rd Psalm a moment. The Lord is my shepherd. In other words, I'm under someone else. The Lord is my shepherd. And what's the next thing that follows? I shall not lack anything. I shall not want. That's the natural result. That's what Jesus teaches. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. What kind of sheep lies down in a green pasture? A full sheep. Right? If they're not full, what are they doing? Not lying down. See? Lead me beside the still waters. Sheep like to drink from still waters. They don't like running, rushing water. A sheep that is led by still water is a sheep that is not thirsty. And you remember Jesus said in John 4, when he's talking to the woman of the well, the water I shall give them, they will never thirst again. But the water I shall give them will be a well of water springing up unto eternal life. The 23rd Psalm is a picture of the person who has taken their kingdom back under the kingdom of God. And you lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. If I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. So what you have here then is a picture of the with God life. The other is a picture of the with me life. The with God life is the life of abundance and righteousness, just like Paul saw. Those who receive abundance of grace... And the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Christ Jesus. It's with God. It's with Christ. It's with his word coming to us, both in the Bible and through the fellowship of believers, but also personally addressing us in the circumstances where we live as salt and light in his kingdom. Let me just conclude with a comment about Luke 8, 18. And this is a passage where Jesus has just given the parable of the sower. And you remember he talks about how the sower went out to sow. And this is a teaching about the kingdom of God. And as the sower sowed, different things happened to the seed. And sometimes I think uh, we read this passage as if it were fatalistic, as if you couldn't help what was happening with the seed. But I don't think that was his intent. And if you read that passage carefully, uh, you come to verse 16, um, where the initiative of God comes into play. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with container, 
with a container. In other words, the sower who comes out to sow the word of the kingdom of God, it's not his intention that it should be covered up. It's his intention that it should be lifted up, that it would give light to everyone in the house. And that's how we are the light of the world where we are. And God has appointed each of us a place where we are the light of the world to receive his word into our life, the word of the kingdom, and live with that. But he goes on in this passage, verse 18, take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him shall more be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. Think a moment about that phrase. Take care how you listen. Now, we've already said this evening that God normally does not run over us with his word. And in the morning, we'll talk more about the gentleness of his word. But if we wish to be people who live hearing God, we want to live a life of careful listening. And the gentle word of God, which we can learn to recognize, is something, if we don't listen with care, we will not hear. We will not recognize it. That's one reason why the disciplines with the spiritual life are so important, because they are ways of listening. If we do listen, we will hear. And what we have been given through the sowing of the word of the kingdom will be added much more as we go on living in the kingdom of God. But if we don't listen with care, even what we've heard might be lost. And that's a pretty serious teaching that Jesus is giving The Word of God comes to us in a hearing life, a life that is lived in the Spirit with a mind turned to the Trinity. The Word of God comes, and it can fill our lives if we want it. But we have to want it. We have to seek it. And if we don't want it, God will allow us to live the with me life. And the with me life is the source of all our troubles. Now, when we begin to seek the word of God, then increasingly everything that we do will be accompanied by his word to us. Not just do this and do that. Because most of what he will say to us is not directions as to what we're to do, but light on what is happening around us, on what is in our heart, what is moving other people. And in the light of that, we will know more and more of what to do, many times without asking. You would not be happy with a child who only spoke to you when they needed to know what to do, would you? You'd like to have some times of fellowship, of sharing, of learning. And as you do that, then more and more it will be clear what you are to do. Some people know that I have been a little critical of the book Uh, that tells us that what we want to do is to always be asking, what would Jesus do? What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it is, in most cases, you should already know. I have been happily married to a woman for 55 years. At this point in our life together, I don't need to ask what she wants and what she regards as good. Well, there are a few points, and I have to be careful about that. (laughs) 
but by and large, it's our life together with Jesus in his kingdom that sharpens us and enables us to hear God's word as it comes to us, often without any issue of what we're to do, but just to know him better. That I would know him is the prayer of Paul, and as we know him, he speaks in our hearts. Now, I want to take a break now and uh, give you a chance to get your blood to circulate a little bit.